fit dinkum. Should we start with Salaamu Alaikum? Arika Salaamu Alaikum is uh, fitting. Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the Fitting Podcast. We're here with my uncle Bilal Asad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not your uncle. <laughs> we're related. We're, we're related. Lebanese thing. We're related. Yeah. Everyone's an uncle. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. well, welcome to the podcast, Sheikh. Yeah. Happy to have you on. Uh, where in Lebanon are you pleasure. from? We're from the village called uh, Betayub. Betayub. So the, the the municipality is called Akkar. Okay, Akkar. Yeah, I've heard of Akkar. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, we're from up the mountains, like right the up there. <laughs> Akkar. So North Lebanon, yeah. but from the mountains. Mashallah. So tell us about your life. What's been going on? And you know, now it's school holidays. T- like, give us a rundown what you do on a day to day, week to week. Oh, everyone's going to know my life now. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> uh, now we've been in lockdown because of the social, uh, the uh, social distancing and the coronavirus and everything. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala lift it. Amen. So obviously, we've been reflecting. I've been reflecting a lot. I've been mm. learning a lot more, reading, writing notes, mm. learning for my own self development. I. Uh, Enjoy my time with my kids, and I've connected a lot with my own parents. Believe it or not, my parents were in Lebanon for a while, and now they're back here. And mm. My father wants to leave, but now he can't. Yeah, so we're connecting a lot more. A lot of time spent with my mum and dad. Alhamdulillah. And uh, I've never, I've had that connection with them when I was a child, but it's been a while mm. because we we live together in the same place. Oh, you live with them now? Yes, okay, yes, yes. Well, w- I don't know. I live with them. They live with me. Yeah. One of the two. And uh, we're all together in the same place, so alhamdulillah. So it's more like your own self-development. Self-development. I think that's the, what quarantine is about. A lot of people are now kind of understanding that they've got to improve on themselves first and prioritize yes, them more. definitely. Mm. Everyone, no matter, w- even myself, there's so much for me to think about. As mm. your life develops, every stage of your life, you've got to reflect again. You've got to look at, okay, where's my new goal? Where's, what have I done right? What have I done wrong? Mm. All the time, until you die. So what books do you read? <laughs> that got me. <laughs> when you said the books, I'm like, I have to ask. Most of the books I read are in Arabic. Okay. I enjoy reading in Arabic because you get more of the meanings out of them. Mm. Uh, so I have a, a collection of, of classic books. I have the uh, the six major, the, the main hadith books. Okay. You know, the, you yeah, know, Abu Dawud, Muslim Tirmidhi. Yeah. I have Nail, a book called Nail al-Awtar for Fiqh. I have Tafsir bin Kathir and Tafsir of other yeah. books that are... Uh, in, when you're English speaking, you're not going to know all their names, mm, mm. but some of them are really. I, I love reading. Um, have you? Do you know the scholar Ibn Al Qayyim? Of course. Yes, yeah, so I love reading a lot of his books. Mm. There's a beautiful book called Hadil Arwah. It's a very all about paradise and the hereafter. Mm. Especially now, I've been reading a lot from that one uh, in, in this time of my life. And uh, there's a doubt with Dawa also, medicine and its cure, yeah. uh, the, the sickness and its cure. Talks a lot about self development and reflection. Mm. I'm really just enjoying reflecting a lot on my inner self. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. yeah. Even us, we talk about like productivity and people we listen to on podcasts. They always say like meditation. Like so how has it got us recently onto meditation? Yeah. And just reading more and listening. That kind of thing. Believe Journaling. it or not, I'm, I read a lot about s- uh, space, Okay. science. That's, a, really that's your interest, yeah? So yeah. intrigued by it. Yeah. I even watched on Netflix, I was telling my family, there's a show called History 101. Yep. Yeah, and they had the space race. Also, how actually told me about yeah, it? How good? Which ones did Walla. you listen to? I watched majority of them were just ones that were like, I tried to stay away from the feminism one because I know it's a bit controversial. Because mm. I'm not too sure what ideology, ideolo- like the ideology and stuff like that. I'm touch and go with me. Yeah. Casey, become a feminist? Probably not. But <laughs> 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 no, no, I love women equal. You know, <laughs> <All that's laughs> but um, but no, what I'm saying is like the things that I'm more interested in were like the Iraq War. Like, for example, how oil was made, how the way there used to yeah, be yeah. actually like a lot, like it used to be a sea, like in the desert, and then everything submerged and then oil was created underneath the surface of mm. the sand and that sort of stuff. Like, mm. that sort of stuff trips me out. And it's like the 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 the, the organisms that were, uh, that died, that floated to the bottom, they created oil yeah. through like... That's uh, very interesting to me. Yeah. Do you get what I'm But I say to our young brothers and sisters all the time, read what interests you. But so long as it's beneficial, mm. right? Don't waste your time a lot on, on other things that are superficial. Stuff like this, and I like to make the connection with the Quran. Which verses can I make a connection with with that? Uh, with the earth layers? With the, what does sky mean in, in, in the Quran? When you study these things, you actually, when you study about scientific discoveries, you make a better connection with the Quran. Mm. Uh, our recent um, 
encounter, which is, uh, to me, I, I never thought I would ever talk about this, is talking to friends and my own father about the earth being flat or round. Uh, <laughs> ask that question. <laughs> it's been frustrating me. There's a lot of scholars that believe it. I've heard a few, a few. Actually, okay. more and more scholars believe that the world is round. Alhamdulillah. I, I believe the majority of them. Majority of them do, mm. uh, but yeah. But the more and now, I became intrigued in learning much mm. more about. It. I've learned about astronomy a little bit, but this mm. time going really deeper into the the knowledge, and you, and you connect a lot with the Quran. For example, for example, you know the word Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, uh, um, uh, mm. "The one who created mm. seven skies on top of each other in layers." The word "sabah." Seven does not necessarily mean number. You're only seven, seven. Mm. You're only above six, less than eight. Mm. In the Arabic language, it's a very commonly known thing in Arabic linguistics. When the Arabs used to say saba, it means kathra, a lot. Mm. Yeah. So it could be thousands even, yeah. or sabin, or yeah. sabami. And it's there's the magic no number that can be the magic number sabah, yeah. sabah, like and Huh? Like several, several, many, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and that 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 makes more sense now to me. Yeah, about. It's learning about the layers of the universe and, and the atmosphere and so on and so forth. Mm. It's just an example. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sabah and, and seven Earths. You know, yeah. Many layers, not just seven, seven. Mm. SubhanAllah. So would that be the same on uh, six days? <laughs> or six parts of time? I was thinking of that. That's you know something about the six parts of time and that? There's also a mm. big study on that. You could understand that um, uh, even though the Quran says six days, mm. right, creating the Earth and, and then rose to the heavens and all that, that number is a time fragment. It's not 24 hours. There were no days when yeah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created the, the, mm. the heavens and the earth. Mm. There was no sun. There was no moon. There was no rotation in the solar system to count the days. You know, to begin with. So, what does it mean? Days. Days means time. In Arabic, again, days can mean a period of time. It could be uh, a million years can be counted as one day. Did you not hear that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says one day to Allah is like a thousand years of what you count? Mm. For example in a day on a day of judgment that is equal to 50,000 years. What does that mean? You know, sometimes uh, a person who goes to sleep, you know the story of that man who died in his sleep? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Al-Uzair in Surah Yasin, and when he passed by a land that was dead, and he said, who can revive it after it's, it has died? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let him die for a hundred years. And when he woke up, he said, how, uh, the angel said to him, how long did you sleep? And he said, a day or part of, the, part of, a, da part of mm -hmm. a day. The angel said to him, you've, You've slept. You've died for a hundred years, right? Now, to that person who died, he doesn't know what a hundred years is. To mm. him, it's a day or a part of a day. Mm. So, it's when you come to numbers in the Quran, don't take it literally. It's so perspective. Funny. It's yeah. it depends on at what time, what period, in whose perspective. Yeah, it's like the seven hundred years, the hadith about the angel that carries the throne of Allah. For the, example, the ear to the shoulder, seven hundred years. The distance. I think, uh, I think a bird flying or something. Was that the one? Different, there's different narrations, there's different narrations yeah. galloping horse, uh, traveling, but all of them, you don't, uh, you know, there are parts of the Quran, don't take them literally. Yeah. Mm. They have a va more vast meaning than that. And Allah subhanahu wa tells us, it's good they opened this topic, it's interesting to me, you know, I don't want to take up the whole podcast. <laughs> oh, talk, but uh, yeah. it's very interesting to me just to show that it, uh, something that interests me, I love learning about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, making the connection with the Quran makes you appreciate the Quran much, much more. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, um, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتُنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ وَمِمَّا لَا يَعْلَمُونَ We will show them more signs of Allah in the horizons, in space, and in themselves, and things they never knew before. Mm. So if we discovered some new things now in science and made a connection with the Qur'an, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had talked about this and we begin to understand it even better, uh, it's, the old scholars didn't necessarily know it. We know it better now because Allah says, "In the future, I'm going to teach you more. I'm going to. We're, we're always going to learn more. We learn more about science. Yeah, more research. Yeah. Science, yeah. maths, and yeah. And don't make the mistake of the Quran being a science book. The Quran mm. is not a science book because you know science cannot doesn't talk about morals, doesn't talk about supernatural things, right? Um, science is limited. And if we're going to look at Quran as science, then we're mm. saying the Quran is limited as well. Speaking on supernatural things, like. I've always wondered because nowadays they've they've emphasized a lot on psychology and subconscious and conscious like actions that you do, yeah. Um, to what degree does a devil or jinn? What degree do they have control over you in your actions? For example, you know they talk about what's what's yeah. and that sort of stuff. Because sometimes, yeah, there's a lot of people that talk about oh, well, you're possessed by a devil, and yeah. now it's coming out that it could possibly not be the case. 
We're going to have a lot of youngsters listening to this one now. Mm. This is <laughs> I don't want to scare anyone with it because this topic can be scary to some people about possession and uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, it um, uh, What's what's that? Yeah, like so they probably get a bit paranoid about it. But I'm going to talk uh, – when you know the reality of things, then you're less afraid of it. You have mm. more control. So knowledge is power. Knowledge is, is good. It, it saves you from fear. So, um, you know, like exorcisms and things like that. Mm. So apparently, you know, the movies about exorcism, uh, it never affected me at all. And people say that, oh, the, the film The Exorcist mm. made me so scared. It's the most scariest film I've ever seen in my life. Mm. I don't see anything. Some people are afraid of those little dolls, little clowns. Yeah. yeah. Subhanallah, for me, I didn't get affected. And I think because from a young age... I was introduced to the world of the jinns and the world of mm. the So you had that faith devils. in your heart. You yeah, because I knew their reality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, tells us, inna kayda shaytani kana da'ifa. The mm. power of the shaytan is always weak. Mm. right? And then in Surah Al-Jinn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa annahu kana rijalum nal insi a'udhuna bi rijalim nal jinni fazaduhum rahaqa. And there used to be these people who didn't understand the, the nature of jinn, so they'd go to deserts and then one of them would stand up and they would seek refuge in the jinns to not harm them so Allah says so the jinns increased in making them afraid because the jinns are actually afraid mm. of humans but then when they found that they're actually afraid of them the jinns go oh let's play games on them there's even a guy a, a sahabi who came to the Prophet oh. and he Allah. says Ya Rasulullah Ya Rasulullah I saw in my dreams like my head's on the floor and it's rolling in front of me and I'm trying to catch my head I'm terrified and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laughed he said if the shaitan the, the jinn in your dream the shaitan plays games on you do you have to tell everybody that he's playing games on you he's taking you for a ride he's you know um, uh, what's the word for it you know, when, you know on YouTube how they do those pranks like he's pranking mm. you yeah. Yeah, shows how many pranks I do. <laughs> well, I've done a lot of pranks. I just didn't know that it was called a prank. <laughs> anyway, the, the shaitan, look, first of all, you know what shaitan means? A lot of people, no, I, don't know I, I want to see, what, what do you think shaitan means? Devil. Devil. Satan. Yeah, just Satan is shaitan, evil, yeah. Like Lucifer, yeah. this, all these names, right? Look. Baphomet. The jinns are another life form. We believe in them because the Quran told us about it. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a whole surah called Surah Al Jinn. They're made of the fire and we are made of clay, of earth. Marij in Minnar. Marij, some Mufassirun said, you know, when you light up a barbecue and you can see the heat waves, hmm. that's what they're made of, the jinns. So the hot wind. The hot kind wind. of like that, but they're, yeah, you, you also call that fire. Fire has many names. Lava can be called fire, hot weather can be mm. called fire, yeah. heat waves are called fire, uranium is called fire. Um, you know, all these things called fire. Mm. Anyway, the uh, the jinn, we can't see them. And Allah says this in the Quran. Shaitan is the act of evil. So when a jinn does lots of acts of evil, it's called a shaitan. A shaitan mm. jinn. When a human does lots of acts of evil, he or she is called shaitan oh, al-ins. The shaitan of the human. Yeah. Mm. And this is in hadith, yani, shaitan al-ins. Mm. Which one's worse? <laughs> well, shaitan al-jinn is subtle because you can't see him. They whisper. Mm. But the shaitan of the ins is more dangerous because you see him in front of you. He's your mate, probably your mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't know that he's a shaitan. He's calling you to do haram. You say, mm -hmm. shaitan rajim, what happens to your mate? He sticks around. <laughs> quiet, quiet, stop, stop, <laughs> stop talking weird stuff, man. Come on. <laughs> but the jinn, the real jinn, he runs away. Mm. There's even uh, you know the authentic hadith when a person makes an adhan. The shaitan runs away while passing wind. Yeah, I can imagine him in The Simpsons running away, and going, <laughs> <laughs> running away, passing wind, and coming. Away. They're, they're, they're like little kids, some of them. Yeah. Oh. Don't be afraid of them too much. But when it comes to possession, we say it's called possession, but in the Quran, there's a there's a word called mas. It gives an example of a person who. The ones who consume riba interest from, you know, interest is usury, usury. You interest mm -hmm. is just a word. Usury is the real word. Making uh, more profit on money when you do, when entitled to it. Anyway, those who consume riba in this life on the day of judgment will not come out of their graves except in the state as though somebody was stricken by uh, a mas. A mas is like being touched. And uh, we also use the word mas. It's Allahu Alam what it means, but mas means a condition of we connect it to insanity or a disorder of some sort that's that's touching no and it's phenomenal that no one can explain. Mm. Like and then some people say it's a possession. But we don't know the reality of it. 
Yeah. Some people, yeah. some scholars actually have written lots of stuff about it and say that the shaitan actually enters your body and controls your mind and your hands and everything. I don't know, maybe. But there's also evidence on the other side that he doesn't, or he doesn't actually control your actions and everything, mm. but it has an effect on how you think in so, sometimes. Have you met someone who's had it? Of course I have, yeah. Many, many. I used to do it all the time in my life, but I just don't have time for it. <laughs> so please, I don't want people to start calling me after <laughs> saying, can you do a, a ruqya? It's called ruqya. ruqya mm. In the English, in English they call it exorcism, but that's not the right translation. Don't, don't use the word exorcism, because if you say exorcism, you think of the movie Exorcist mm. and yeah. all these terrible things. The no, no, we don't do that. But it's Ruqya is a spiritual healing. That's mm. the correct word. You recite certain passages of the Quran. I've seen it happen a long time. I can't explain it all. Mm. I don't believe the shaitan is literally uh, moving you like a puppet. I'm going to have enemies now after this. <laughs> uh, they'll say to me, no, it's true, it moves you like the puppet. I don't believe that. I believe that there is something there that affects the person's way of thinking. Now, you know what? I'm actually not even interested in trying to explain it. What I'm interested in is, if this person is like that, whatever it is, we say go to a doctor, go to a psychologist and everything, we can't find anything there, then we do a ruqya, a spiritual healing. Mm -hmm. We can even do a spiritual healing before they go to a doctor because a spiritual healing, if it doesn't benefit, it won't harm. Right? It's just mm -hmm. Qur'an in the area. Yeah. But I've seen them get affected all the time mm -hmm. just from the Qur'an, which shows you the power of the Qur'an, subhanAllah. And... Uh, when you read on them and they get better afterwards, I say, Alhamdulillah, if it works, then do it. So long as it's halal. Mm -hmm. Rasulullah said, uh, mm -hmm. لا بأس ما لم uh, Nothing wrong with spiritual healing, so long as it's not making partners or associating partners with Allah. So if it works, I'm going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. We've had several cases like that. I don't want to keep... We've got many stories yeah. like that. I've mm. even heard stories about some people, like my friend, they do khuruj in India, and they tell me stories, like they go to a little village in India, and they're like, you know, the tabliki is like, some of the Indians will get bitten by snakes, they'll spit on their hand, they'll put it on top of it, and they'll start reading al fatiha and they'll heal. And I'm, I'm thinking... Uh, so, do they have evidence? I don't know, that's a, that's a story someone yeah. told me. It's yeah. like, I don't know if it's true. Yeah, you've got to be careful, a, Ashraf... Yeah. Uh, I'm not doing that. I think it's going to buy a snake. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm going straight no. to the doctor. going to get a snake, bro. One thing, this is actually a good point you made, without talking about a particular group or anything, mm. and I respect my brothers of who course, go on yeah. Furuj. I respect them. I used to actually... A lot of my friends do it. Yeah, I used to do it. My yeah. father was... You know, lots of people who came off the streets, These mm. they, we, owe, we owe it to these brothers. Mm. Allah reward them who helped them amin, come out. And every Muslim, every Muslim group has good in them, inshallah, so long as we can work together, wallahi lazim. Anyway, but uh, uh, what I was going to say about that is, in general, in general, I am a big skeptic with things that are just told and I don't have solid evidence or reference mm. to know where they're from. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, some common things that Muslims, from when, as I was growing up here in, in Australia and overseas, you hear all these different stories. Some of the common ones was that Neil Armstrong... Neil Armstrong heard the Adhan on the moon. Have you heard that one before? Of course. <laughs> Neil Armstrong, oh my God. he ain't a Muslim. He's still, I don't know what religion he is. He'd never heard any Adhan on the moon. And now those same Muslims who tell me Neil Armstrong heard the Adhan on the moon, they say, I don't even believe if they even got to the moon. Mm. So let alone that. Sometimes people see uh, a cloud. And it says the name Allah. Allah. Oh, yeah, cloud. You can make a thousand images of the cloud. You get all those WhatsApp messages forward to you, all these signs yeah. of Allah. Some people might think that's a sign for me. Yeah. You know what? In nature, mm. Allah says there are signs for you in nature. But it doesn't have to be specifically the name. Because mm. Arabic is all squiggles. You mm. can, I remember some brothers, uh, they told me we're having a barbecue. And then the barbecue fell. And the, uh, the ashes went on the, on the wall. And subhanallah, every one of us saw this was the name of Allah. I said, what do you expect from a language that's a matter of squiggly lines? <laughs> <laughs> so we don't need to hold on to these things. I love the sheikh. We don't need to hold on to this. Someone found a tomato all over YouTube. It's got the name of Muhammad on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 have you seen the tomato? It's all yeah. squiggly on the inside. And the lion that goes, says Allah. The lion. <laughs> Wallah. Wallah. Maybe he's saying like what the students at our school sometimes say, or any school, when you tell them, did you do it? And they say, no, I didn't. Say Wallah. They go, Wallah. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, the same he way. Did, and he come and say, you said Wallah. I said, I didn't say Wallah. I said, Wallah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't count. <laughs> but uh, these these things that we hear about, mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us the Qur'an. That's mm. enough, inshallah. That's we, don't need, we don't need this. You know, like, for example, you've got other religions, they've mm. got a statue. 
suddenly it's crying. Mm. When I was in Lebanon, I remember a statue of what they call Mary. Someone put something in there. I don't know what had happened. From that statue, blood blood was falling out of its eyes. Everybody thought, this is a sign That's from scary. God. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've watched Hollywood. We've seen all those scary mm. movies. Everyone, anyone can do stuff like that. Mm. Or was that, that guy who read some words and someone came out of the coffin. Muslims don't need to, uh, you know. So we don't want to talk about it. a snake bit him. Said al Fatiha. If it worked for him, alhamdulillah. Yes, that's it. We just <laughs> leave it. Like if it worked, <laughs> alhamdulillah. If it worked, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, alhamdulillah. The Quran, the shortest verse in the Quran is the shortest surah is how long? Three. Three ayahs. I'm trying to think of how Three many ayahs. <laughs> you know how many lines? If you were to write it, how many lines? Is One it? and a half. One and a half mm-hmm. lines. And the Quran, what does it already say? This is a great challenge. This is a great miracle. But the Quran says to the early Arabs even, the ones who were linguistics, from where we learn our Arabic from, if you don't believe this is from Allah, or if you have doubt, then bring a book like it. Not copy it. Bring a unique book like it. Meaning, in another language. In your own language, but follow a different pattern, different style, different everything. One at its level. No one could. He said, all right, how about ten verses? The ten uh, surahs, they couldn't. And then finally, what did it say? Fatubi suratim min mithli. Bring one chapter like it. Mm. And the shortest is in Nautainaka al Kautha. Fasali li rabbika wanhar inna shani aka huwa al abdur. There's a story about Musaylam al Kadhab. Have you heard of that man before? I've heard there of him. Musaylam al Kadhab. Musaylam al Dalai. Musaylam, you know, you say Muslim. Yeah. Mm. Muslim means one who submits to the truth and justice of, of Allah. Mm. And uh, this guy was called Musaylama, meaning uh, the try-hard Muslim or little or little Muslim. So when you say someone's Musaylam, he's a faker. So Musaylama, al kadhab the liar, that's what he's called. He said that I'm a prophet at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says, I believe Muhammad's a prophet. But I'm also a prophet. They go to him, what did you get? And he goes, well, he got a surah about the elephant. He goes, I also received verses about the elephant. They go, tell us. And he was a poet. He goes, Al-Filu wa ma'adraka mal-Filu. He sounds like Qari'a wa ma'adraka mal-Qari'a. Al-Filu wa ma'adraka mal-Filu lahu khurtumun tawilu wa dhaylun athilu. The elephant. And we would explain to you the elephant. He has a long trunk and a short tail. They said to him, may Allah make you hideous. Qabbahak Allah. How could you just... And they say, ah, oh, well, a lying prophet from us is better than a truthful prophet from Quraysh. And this is the world we live in today. Superficial, trying to uh, manipulate people into thinking and believing things. I'm talking now, you know, in social media, how people advertise and show mm. themselves to influence other people mm. to believe things that are not real. Why? They want benefit out of it. Mm. Either uh, capital to capitalize on us, make money out of us. Consumerism, to get us involved in buying and buying and buying. Um you know, uh, uh, celebrity culture and so on. Even popularity. A lot of people want to be known and want to be like the person people go to for advice or, oh, I want to live a life like him and just show mm. off certain areas of their life for that. They seek which is why they use social media. Like, if someone travels a lot, they might do that. If someone eats out a lot. If someone has a nice car. It's like certain areas of people's lives people want to kind of show off. That's sad that our happiness is now has now come down to superficial things. Right, superficial things. Uh, and, you know, with this lockdown that we've had, uh, some people feel like their lives are ruined, even though we're allowed to go out for the essential things. Mm. You, you got your essential, you got water, you've got supermarkets with everything that you want. You're still having family. Over, uh, you're, st- you're still seeing family. I mean, yeah, it's limited, but you're still seeing them. We've got the internet at the tip of our fingers. I remember before the lockdown, mm. we're all together. And everybody's on their phone anyway. <laughs> you know, 5G, 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 they're going to ruin our lives. The only reason 5G came up is because we want it. Mm. Everybody wants to be on their phone. If the internet doesn't go well, what do we say? Oh, the internet's crap, man. Far out. <laughs> mm. So 5G comes up because we're in supply and demand. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Anyway, the, uh, what were we saying? Saying something it's about just like even isolation. Just, yeah. But even yeah, just so social media, I want to hear about like your stance on it because so hell's been offered for a couple months. You know, I I just got off it recently, and I've you know like even just your stance because you understand you speak to the youth daily. You know, working at the yeah, school, yeah, the so school or outside the school. Yeah, social media is just everywhere. It's an epidemic. Um, 
we were talking before about millennials and, and generation yeah, yeah. Gen generation Z, Z yeah there's gen, gen Z are the ones sort of born after 95 the millennials are 2000 mm. it's called the millennium mm. the, remember the, were yeah. you born in no I'm right before but I, I understand like even like the year level yeah. before me when they were in school it like from year seven they had iPads in class yeah. and that's where their books were so about the, it, it yeah. was like very different like imagine learning from your iPad yeah. yeah, that's right. So in about 2006, yeah. Facebook came out. Mm. And I still remember, you know, we had more social, we had a, a better social life. You know, the stress levels were less. And there'd been done, so many new studies have been done by experts, experts. I've, I've, I've read about it so much that uh, the numbers are quite frightening at the moment. What does it say? So uh, the Generation Z people were actually their minds, their brains have developed. So they were kids and mm. their brains have developed around social media. This is now their world. Mm. Uh, it's very hard for them to live without it, actually. Their whole world is on there. That's really frightening when you have the entire globe judging you, mm. the entire globe uh, disagreeing and showing other ways of, of, um, of what they think uh, according to their ideals and their uh, religion or their thinking and then influencing other people. And it all depends on who can get more views and who can have the, the, the gift of the of the gag and who has the skills to sort of beat someone else and yeah. get themselves really the popular. You can get a completely ignorant fool and come up and they become it. Mm -hmm. Right? I'll give you... A, I'm going to get back to... So, well, let's finish with, with this one first. Um, social media... Experts and lots of studies have done by professionals that uh, that um, since 2006 onwards, as the app started to show up, they see a significant rise, a, a very sharp rise, very sharp rise, especially between 2010 to 2012, of depression, anxiety, and even self-harm. First, it started mostly among the girls. Why? Because girls psychologically internalize things and they're not bullies with their fists they're not antisocial so they see an opportunity to go onto the social media and ruin the hell out of their reputation or their so or their friends and and make their own you know mm -hmm. sort of groups and these girls start self-harming just so that they can feel that they still exist that they still have a self-esteem that they are important that they are they want to be validated validated mm -hmm. the boys on the other hand they um, they went onto social media, and then with the with the increase of uh, of the social media platforms, Instagram, Snapchat came out, TikTok, and the rest of it. Um, what happened was uh, they found that the boys use social media mostly for gaming and pornography. They don't bully each other on mm. on social media much, and uh, as time went on, suicide rates started to increase. And the gap between boys and girls' suicide rates became even closer. So there were boys and girls. Um, and what happens is you go on social media to try and... You, you, some people have grown up in, in, in uh, high-conflict households. And they feel they don't have anywhere to go. They lock themselves up in the room and want to find an outlet. Somebody to hear them. Somebody to... Just so they can validate that they are still normal. You go on social media and it depends... Who do they get in contact with? What kind of things are said to them? Parents are the last to hear. I get very scared of that. I mean, I, I get scared for my, my children sometimes. With when I see a lot of teenagers and children, they lock themselves up in a room. Mm. What are they doing? Who are they talking to? What's mm. happening? Right, what's Next minute you hear about, I'm also a school counsellor. So the next thing you hear about is someone's harmed themselves or they've gone and done something stupid and you're the last person to know. So self-harm has been on the rise. It's all about this validation. Validate me. I'm here. I want, and validation has become uh, as simple as how many views you get, mm. how many likes you get. Yeah. Mm. Wow, man! Like somebody just comes and just you're just sitting there, and um, you're probably so depressed and just whatever. You see something you like, just give a click, move on. Mm. That person who just received your dopamine like, hit, and they start smiling. Oh, let me go see the likes. You've, you've yeah. moved on. It means the world to them. That <laughs> yeah. one like that one like, button you just did. Like, right. yeah, what they now that's a good thing it? that you liked something that someone. Yeah. yeah. But what happened with with that from your end? You're expecting this type of validation. This is what you're relying on now to survive. Mm. And when you don't get those likes for whatever reason, especially if someone blocks you, or especially with teenagers, someone blocks you, or 
man, it's like your life is, is mm. it gets really, really difficult. Yeah. Um, so we have that staggering figure. I don't know if parents are listening here, but um, there has to be that community work from principals and schools, from parents. Mm. I think that um, if, if you're a teenager or you're an adult you know, in your 20s, uh, monitor yourself and discipline yourself with screen time. Uh, no child, for example, needs the um, their gadgets uh, before they you know in bed. Let them yeah, go to sleep. They don't, bed, yeah, they don't need their Fitbits. They don't need their Apple Watches. They don't need their iPads and all that stuff. Because mm. you know, like year twelve, for example, you're in year twelve and you have got your exams happening. You're supposed to be staying up to study if you want to. And then you got this device with you. Friend comes up, you talk to them. Another thing comes up. Another thing's up. Next minute, they haven't slept all night. They go to school. I've had this. <laughs> I see this all the time. You get. What happened to you, man? Why are you sleeping in class? It's, wallah, sir, wallah. I don't know why they say wallah, but <laughs> wallah, sir, wallah. I've been all night studying. I've been all night. but uh-huh. And I know yeah. they haven't been studying all night. Yeah. Because I... I, I they would have given up. A lot of kids can't study all night. Like I don't know be because else. I know the future or, or yeah. the, the unseen. I know because some of their parents have spoken to me already. <laughs> right? So, but I don't, I don't want to put them on the spot. Yeah. Some of them, uh, you know, I don't know what they've been on. I mean, what's have being fried up? how they're frying their brains up mm. or whatever. Um, so what do you think it's, there needs to be more of a connection between child and adult with yeah. like restrictions? Because sometimes course. restrictions on, can only do so much. Do you think there's like the internal no, discipline no, no. where they have to start understanding that they can't find value in it? Yeah. yeah. See, look, why don't we start by, first of all, uh, being aware of the dangers of social media. Because not everything about social media is bad. Okay, being aware of the psychological manipulation that those who invented them and created them are doing, right? It's like the what they do in casinos, so that you can keep coming back and betting again and again and again. Yeah, in casinos, it. yeah, in casinos, you've, you're, you're you're betting and you're gambling how much money you're going to get out of it. Mm. Sometimes you lose, sometimes you get it, and then you go crazy. The social media, you're betting. You, what are you gambling? Time. You're, you're, you're what is it? Your internal, like, the validation part of things. Like, you. How you feel. Oh, yeah. You, your soul, man. Yeah, you, yeah. you sell your soul to social media. You right? are the currency, man. Yeah. Or you're the product. It's you. You you now become that currency. So you're putting yourself in the slot machine. Yeah, and you're waiting for these people to give you value. Yeah. The less likes, the less valuable you think. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, you got to be aware of what that social media is. And you got to be aware that those who created these, um, these gadgets, they don't give them to their kids. That's, That's number true. one. Awareness is very important. Allah says, فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّهُ Know first. Learn mm. that there is no God but Him. So you've got to know the outcome of things and why they're happening. Number two, start restricting yourself. Discipline yourself. If you can't, parents need to jump in. School needs to jump in. right? And, uh, and restriction is very important. Learn more about the fear of Allah. And I would say to you, brothers and sisters, Okay, since you're on YouTube or you're on Facebook, why don't you go and visit some good talks about the hereafter, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's in store for you in the hereafter, a little bit about death. Fearing Allah helps you. Okay, sometimes yeah. you need you need fear. No, you fear helps you. Well, Not just always hope, hope, hope. It's like, I'm going to paradise, I can keep doing all this other stuff. It, it doesn't work that way, you know. Uh, I also, look... I had some students who sometimes we have uh, sex education. They do that at school? Not not yet, but I'm, I'm trying to push for it and others are pushing for it. But sometimes Child. we have sex yeah. education anyway it's on the side, off the yeah. curriculum, yeah. outside of the curriculum. I think it's become a very important topic even from grade five. Okay. No, I'm not in the school. I don't even have younger siblings like that. Everywhere, young, so everywhere. everywhere. The but pornography starts to come into play at year uh, six, grade everywhere. six, year seven. It gets yeah. earlier, like by the year. Yeah, like, bro. I'm yeah. baffled for the next generation. I don't have kids. You hear about, like, bro, when my <laughs> brother was in grade three, you <laughs> hear about little grade threes talking about that sort of thing. like, what's this way? Look at him and I'm like, what? Yeah, the questions start how do you, rising. How do, you, how do kids know that? Yeah. Like, I'm like, how do they know that at that age? Yeah. Like, I went to a non Muslim school, so I've been bombarded with every single statement you can ever think of. And I'm like, I haven't heard this. I don't. I only heard this when I was sixteen, seventeen. Like, what the hell? How do you hear that? But um, one massive thing that I want to talk to you about is the validation part of things. Mm. For example, for for social media, I was listening to a lecture recently about the angels, and um, there was a hadith Jibreel to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi and he talks about um, so the first one was um, uh, live how you want to, but I know that you're gonna die, and then he goes um, love who you want to, but I know they'll leave you. 
or you leave them like because you're you're gonna pass away and then there was the the part where he says that the dignity of a believer is being free of human beings like of attachment towards human beings like that part of the hadith so like if the dignity of human beings is what is 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 when they um is is when they're free from attachment from others so from your dignity human. arises when you at- detach yourself from mm. Yeah. From others, yeah, from yeah. pleasing others, yeah. So I don't know the exact hadith, but I know it's along right, that line. Right. So it's pretty much like that. Yeah. I don't know it as a hadith, mm. but the meaning is correct. Yeah. Many scholars have spoken about it, yeah. and uh, this is a very important advice that uh, seeking validation from people uh, will will actually move you away from Allah and make you forget who you even are, who you are. You don't know who yourself is anymore because now you have given your entire life and who you are to someone else to decide. That is such a dangerous thing. And if you want to be happy, one of the most important things that you need to realize right from a very young age, you decide this from now, is number one, train yourself up here and be around those two or three friends who are also like that, that are positive, like that. Train yourself to believe what you are and what you think is already good. And when I say that, I've got to make a very important note. It doesn't mean that I can be an animal and be comfortable in that. No, no. Morally correct. So uh, let's talk about branding. Brand, brand names. Some people are so obsessed with certain brand names so that they can get validated and get attention and show it. And then, you know, when they get that attention, they feel better about themselves. Why don't you say to yourself, you know what? I'm going to wear clothes that don't have brands. And you know what? I'm going to be comfortable in them. And no matter what anyone says, I'm going to train myself to like what I'm wearing. Who decides what's good and not? Mm-hmm. I do. You tell me that I am stupid or silly. I'll just smile. He says, I'm sorry that you think that, man. I'm really sorry that you think that. I don't believe it. Normal. Mm-hmm. Just go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I disagree with you. <laughs> they even disagreed with Allah. Who am I? You're okay to disagree with me, man. I, I, you know, mm. Kudos to Good on you. If we can develop that attitude, wallah, you'll be much happier. The only time that you will be affected and you start becoming a miserable person in life, and to add to that, they start blaming God for it, right? But it's really Allah has already guided us. He told us the only one that you should be focusing on to please is your creator. Why? Because your creator wants the best for you. It's like when you want to please your parents because they care for you. Not pleasing them because uh, you know you're their slave or anything like that, but because they're the people you really, really trust. They really want your best interest. So I'd rather I'd rather do things to please them because that makes my connection with the people I really trust more. But anyway, the only time you are miserable is when you believe inside of you what that person is saying. Mm. What you say about me, mm. if I believe it, then it's true. Then I'm gonna be miserable. If I don't believe it, Nobody can affect me. SubhanAllah. That's what Allah says in the Quran. When fitna. We always toss and turn you between different states in your life. Bala means to interchange you, to make you face different challenges. You're always like a rocking boat. You're always going to be facing different things. Why? With good and with bad will test you. Or the word is to interchange you and make you go through different journeys in your life. Why? Fitna. Fitna means to help you grow, develop, uh, purify yourself, take away the uh, the stuff that's hurting you from the stuff. But you have to accept that. If you look at this change of the world as something bad for you, why is God doing that to me? Why, why, why? You're never going to see the benefit. I always say, you guys know how to walk. Yeah, how did you walk when you were babies? Have you seen, you got little brothers and sisters? I've got a niece. you got a niece. How old is she? Two. Two. Yeah. Have you watched her start She's to struggling. walk? She's struggling. All right. I want, I want to tell you. Watch this. Watch this. You ready? Re- think about this. From your perception, from you, 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 uh, Suhail, yeah. you're looking at your niece struggling to walk. Yeah. Every time she falls, w- what happens to you? What happens to her mum? Her mum gets up. She's like, oh. She's scared for yeah. her, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we're making her scared. Yeah. 
We're making that baby scared. From our perception, something bad is happening to her. She's falling because we don't fall. But did you know that's a very natural, normal, healthy thing for a baby to fall? Allah has created. Mm. They don't have kneecaps. They don't have um, cartilages. Um, they're able to twist and turn very easily. None of their bones are very flexible. They don't break. Yeah. Right? Allah has already given them the bodyguard. For us falling, that's bad because we don't have the mechanisms a baby has. Now, from the perception of the baby, she is not thinking any way down your line. What is the baby thinking? Yeah. Subconsciously. Like not consciously, subconsciously thinking, I've learned, so she fell a hundred times. I've learned 100 ways of how to stand up. Yeah. That's what the baby's learned. Right. Uh, that didn't work. Okay, now I'm learning how to stand up better. I'm learning what I did wrong so I can do it right. And you know what? Every person in the world is born on this fitra. Fitra means the way God created you to perceive Things about yourself in a positive way and not to stress the little things. SubhanAllah, I heard from one of the great, I think Imam Sayyulti, he says, if adults were like children, wallahi, will be, nobody will be miserable or sad. And I, I think I can remember that he said, a child, uh, if something goes wrong in a child's life, they forget about it a minute later. Mm. They don't stress it. Halas, mm. They move forward. If they fail, they get up again. Uh Oh man, I've got to get those five points. Even child, um, children are very honest. They're very brutally honest. honest and they don't like, obviously, us, we have to have the, you have to know when to be honest and when not to. Not in the sense of lying, but sometimes it can harm the other person. But they're like just brutally honest when you need to be. Like if yeah. their parents ask them something, they'll just be honest and say, yeah, this is what I did. Yes. But us, we always think of, oh, oh, how can I get away with this? Well, what's this person going to say yeah. about me? I said the wrong thing. Yeah. Like I'll give you an example. We're talking about social media influences. Right, um, consumerism that we live in today. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us, "Leis al fakr aladhi akhafu alaykum." In Sahih Muslim and Bukhari, it is not poverty that I fear upon you, my my ummah, but I fear upon you the dunya, the world, and its materialism. That it, that you start to compete for it. Until it destroys you as those before you competed for it and destroyed them. This is not a new thing. Consumerism is not a new thing. Mm. And uh, those uh, people who, who want to capitalize on it, they know that. So some of them make deliberately product obsolescence. Have you ever heard of that thing before? Yeah. Product obsolescence. They make now equipment. Your phone, your printer, your, your, your laptop. See how the battery starts to die out in your yeah. iPhones? That's deliberate. Right? It's got a life. And um, uh, they make it because... Uh, people are conditioned now to always change things. Yeah. Can't have the same thing all the time. Subhanallah. And uh, and they make it like that because that's what we like. We like to keep changing things. And you know, this is where the happiness is. These types of people, subhanallah, when tragedies happen, they're going to find it very, very difficult to face tragedies. I always teach with children, let's teach them that this life is not the life of reward. This is not paradise. If that's your perception of it and you expect it to be that way, you will never be happy. This life, Allah tells us, We have created man in a life that requires challenges and hardships. That's the way you grow and you learn. Once I accept that, then I can move forward. Now, this life is not the life of reward. So when I give you something, I do nice things for him, I do nice things for her, and I expect that God's mm. got to give me something in return, that means I think this is, this is the paradise. Mm. To think that God made this world the paradise? Never. I wouldn't believe in God if this was paradise for us. If he told me this is your paradise, that's not God. Allah says, I am the most generous. I am the most merciful. This is not paradise. He says, one walking, you know, walking stick. Mm. One of a walking stick size of one of you, if you had a walking stick. If you were to place it on the ground of Jannah, of paradise, he said, that space, okay, give it a nice radius and a circumference, just as big as, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a draw a circle around the, the the size of that walking stick. It says that little patch there of paradise is better than the entire world and whatever's in it. Oh. The entire world and whatever's ever is in it. Subhanallah. And he said, I fear that you're going to compete for materialism. You know, mm -hmm. it's fine. You're allowed to have a nice car, a nice house, mm -hmm. a nice, a nice, a nice. Allah says there's no problem. It's in the Quran. In Surah Al-A'raf, Allah says, who ever said that um, you know, enjoyment and good times and nice clothes and nice food and nice whatever is forbidden upon my believers? No, it's all for them. And in the hereafter, I'm not going to judge them for it. I mean, they have it all in the hereafter as well. But when people become obsessed with, 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 with materialistic things, 
even with social media validation, subhanallah, your deen starts to go away, your happiness starts to go away because you've given it to someone else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And your standard now is other people. Your standard is what's the new fashion, what's the new trend, what's the new this, what's the new that. That's your standard now, which continues to always change. You're never going. You're always on 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 um, thin um, ice. So, when it comes to social media influencing, this is manipulation, right? Allah says, "Udru, invite, not brainwash, not manipulate, not gaslight." Okay, let me tell you something. We have social media influencers who are sincere, and there are those who have taken our youngsters for a ride. They use, some of them use religion as a camouflage. Once you get all those views and they make friends with you and they, um, is that what you call it DP? Is that what you call it? Anyone who private message you? D DM, DM. 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 That's how much I know. <laughs> so DM. <laughs> DM. So they DM you or whatever and then you start to establish a connection with them as if they're your friends. Mm. Right? They're your friends. That's how human beings are, right? And uh, you think, man, especially if they're famous, you know, you yeah. ashraf someone talking to you famous, you say, oh man, I'm special. Or a girl, you know, talking to a famous girl, oh, I'm special, she really enjoys. But actually, you don't really know about their life. Mm -hmm. all, you, all you know about is what they're showing you there, right? And then they, they use religion to get to a point, not all of them, some of them, they use religion and because they're trying to get money off you. They're, try, they're relying on you to give them, to make them into a brand. That person becomes, you are a brand on social media, you can make yourself a brand. And once you become that brand, then... You take away the religious part and then try to justify you taking that religious part. Mm. Right? For example, if you're a, you've become a celebrity and you've acted religious and everything and one day um, you start to do irreligious stuff, then you, then you justify it by saying stuff that they teach us in secularism. Secularization means to change even your language which to become less identifiable with religion and become more identifiable with your own desire, yourself, away from it. So for, I would say, for example, instead of saying "Salam alaikum" to you, I would say "Hi" to you, right? Instead of um, you know, I would say, um, "I'm just being me, man. Love yourself. Love the shell that you're in. Um, like who you are." These these are these are empty statements. They're manipulative mm. statements. Sure. All right, what do you mean? If I've got a problem, love myself in my problem, yeah, or try to work towards getting help and and, and developing and fixing. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Qad aflaha man zakaha wa qad khaba man dasaha." Whoever purifies themselves and develops themselves, right, into good morals and the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has advised you because he created us, then you has you are successful. And whoever obeys their desire, you have destroyed yourself, you've degraded yourself. 100%. Right? You know what I'm saying? 100%. Subhanallah. There's a concept, um, I can't remember what philosopher said this. Um, but he was talking about something called shadowing. So shadowing shadowing, yep. It's like you have your realistic self and your idealistic self. Your idealistic right. self is what you want to become. So what you expect to see out of yourself and then your realistic self is what you struggle with day to day, how you feel internally and how you actually are. You know what I mean? So for example, like the occasional bloke that you see on the street, inside he struggles with, for example, um, yeah, definitely, yeah. like with sexual desire. That's one of his massive struggles. Like he really struggles with it. But in his head he, he's saying to himself, nah, I don't have no problem with that and whatever. See, what he says with shadowing is you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be yes. like, well, I have a problem with sexual desire. Khalas, I'm, I'm one of those blokes. I okay. need to make sure that I accept it, not yes. to go in that, in that yes. way, but to be like, I can prevent it from occurring yes. like by cutting yes. it from the head of the snake. What is ikhlas? When Iblis, the head of the shaitans, the satans, the, the king of the satans, Iblis, who was with and in the ranks of the angels, when Allah created Adam, alayhi salam, told him bow, and he told the angels bow to, to what I have created with my, uh, with my hands. To Allah belongs the best of examples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, what, did, what, did uh, uh, what did Iblis say? He got so jealous that he said, you know, I'm not going to hellfire by myself. I'm going to take all his children with me. Why? Because he made him better than me. Okay, and then he said, accept your sincere servants. And sincerity here doesn't mean that I do the wrong thing and I say, oh, I've got a good heart. I kill someone, I say, but I meant well. You don't do that. It means making your, it means trying to do the right thing, but sometimes you make mistakes and you're trying, you're, you mean well, right? you have good intentions. When your inner self and your outer self are the same, then you have reached ikhlas. Ikhlas gets even higher and higher. Scholars have spoken about this tremendously. 
And that is, and it's even in the Quran, when you're alone and only Allah watches you, how are you? That's your true self. Your connection with Allah really manifests there. How you are outside is also called riya. Yura'un and nas Allah's mother describes the hypocrites in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. When they used to spy on a Prophet and um, conspire against him, they used to appear as if they're Muslims. But in the inside, they're actually not Muslims. And they had signs. One of their signs is they just do good only when people are watching them. But when they're alone, it goes down the drain. And in this lockdown, subhanAllah, we had the opportunity to really reflect on ourselves, who we really are. we got no one to impress right now. And at night... I'm just me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, I know that Ramadan, for example, Ramadan came past in lockdown. I know that I'm supposed to be fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now suddenly it's changed from socializing at the mosques, uh, um, getting together for iftar in, in families, then spending the time outside. But now I'm inside. And in Ramadan, I'm supposed to be connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here I am. I don't know what to do. Mm. A lot of people don't know what to do. Mm. And suddenly it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forced us to be guided, to reflect on ourselves. Somebody's falling off a, off a cliff and you love them, like your little, God forbid, your brother, your sister, your parent. And they refuse, like they're holding onto the cliff and they refuse to come up. They want to die. Will you let them? Of course not. If you love them, will you let them? Of course not. You'll grab them. Would you hurt them? by if you, if, you had to, if you had to grab them and it means hurting them or breaking their bone just to save their life, would you do it? Of course. 100%. Life over. Because you love them. Sometimes we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us in a situation From our perspective Like what we see that child trying to walk We think they're falling, they're actually growing We think something's wrong But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes he says Listen, I don't want you to be misguided Allah will not degrade or leave alone his property We are his property Do you think Allah, Al-Malik That's why his name is Al-Malik Al-Malik, meaning I own you. Why would I let go of you? You're my possession. I would, I, there is somebody who trash, thrashes their car and, and trashes it unless they're getting an insurance job. Yeah. No. <laughs> but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He owns us. He wants to look after us. So He puts us in this place. And sometimes we need to go through a bit of struggle and hardship. But mm. we come out of it, inshallah, with better reflection. Allah. Right? And it's still going on and on. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. You know, as we're talking, I get these ideas and then they go. Yeah. Some really good ideas. I wanted to one. talk more about Sahel's point about detachment. You know, like obviously, because we spoke about social media and finding value in it, but then really truly detaching yourself, even with money. You know, risk. Uh, uh, young men, we obviously right, like, we'll, right, right. they say two things young guys want money and girls. So now, like us as Muslims, inshallah, just money. What is it? Say it again. <laughs> what? Like two things young men want, like people in their 20s, yep, yep. girls and money. So you, you know, said games in the eighties like that or in the seventies they made up a proper slogan. Mm. It's called um, "Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll." <laughs> <laughs> Something my dad would say. Yeah. 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 But that's true. That's in the eighties yeah. we, we used to say, and still is. Yeah. it's just a bit more sophisticated yeah. now. Even yeah. For the Muslims, we have different kind of even it's interests and stuff. But yeah. even just like for example, money detachment, trying to because there's value in social media, but just in the general yeah. trying to build that detachment so we can. All right. First of all, Ashraf, very good question. Right, this is uh, we can go on and on about that, and scholars have written books and books upon pages upon volumes with this. Even non-Muslims have done big studies on this. Look, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala first of all doesn't tell us, doesn't order us to detach ourselves from everything, even the dunya, mm. wealth, money, enjoyment, materialism, even you know women. If we're talking from a man's perspective, mm. or from a woman's perspective, from a girl's perspective, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He says no. Part of what I have created for you in this world, I want you to attach yourself to certain things. But within, but on the guidance that I've given you, like attach yourself to the world, but within the guidance I've given you, mm. upon my instructions, because that's the way you will no go, not go lost. Okay? Uh, it's like a coach who puts you on a, on a, on a canoe or in a boat or, 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 or something like that and says to you, listen, this is what you've got to do. You've got to wear your life jacket and go and have fun on the boat, on the canoe. But these are the rules. Stick to these rules and you'll have the best fun, right? And you'll be so attached to the good side of sport. The bad side of sport is when you go on and start harming other people and you're careless and then death can happen and harm can happen. Now suddenly that, that thing, that sport that's meant to be something enjoyable becomes something that's bad. So... Detachment, it depends. You're not asked to detach yourself completely from the dunya and its materialism. But you're asked to manage it and use it in a way that benefits you here 
and in your hereafter. Here and in the hereafter. Mm. Companions, an example. Some companions poor. They, they used to be poor in money. And they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Ya Rasulullah, the wealthy Muslims, so they were wealthy Muslims, mm. like Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, mm. extremely wealthy, Uthman ibn Auf, woof, mm. billionaire. The wealthy Muslims, they donate a lot from their wealth and they're used to develop our community. We can't do that. We want to, they're beating us into mm. paradise. Key point, they're using their wealth for what? Khair. Their families, the community, developing mm. things, putting it into where it should be and they're, and they're helping, right? So Prophet ﷺ said to them, okay, he taught them some words of remembrance. He said, go and say this and you will equal them. So they went home and started doing these remembrance. The wealthy people found out. They started doing the words of remembrance <laughs> as well. So they came back crying out, Rasulullah, oh, they're beating us again. He said, such is life, you know. you got to find your way of how to, you know, this life. We're competing for what? For the hereafter. Mm. Wealth, mm. materialism, a Muslim can enjoy it. But manage it. Manage it in the right place. Okay. Now, attachment, again, the bad attachment is when you come obsessed with it and you feel that this is what makes you who you are. If you have a nice watch, a nice car, a nice school, a nice this, a nice whatever it may be. I've always learnt, and really parents have to play a role from a young age. And if they can't, we can as well. Get into activities that take you out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Listen carefully. Get out of being complacent in a comfort zone. Get out of it. If you can, you're going to be very, very successful. Why? Allah has created us a type that we need to let go of things in order to develop, in order to be happier. Go and take on a job that you know someone's going to say something bad about you. You're going to get a little bit tired. You're going to uh, face some hardships. You know, I once took on a job as a janitor of a school. We were just talking now, Suhail. I don't know if you want to say it. You did you do a side job as well? So, something. I used to be a cleaner. Oh, there you, go. you were a cleaner. I used to be a cleaner. Done something like that. I've, I haven't done. Uh, I've been working from from since I was sixteen. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. The point is, just a very simple example. <laughs> yeah. Take on something that's out of your comfort zone, and then see what happens. Mm -hmm. Right. Suddenly, you start to become a little bit more humbled. A little bit more humbled. When I was working as a janitor, I saw this old guy, who all his life, 60 years old, he's cleaning stuff and cleaning the toilets and things like that. And I thought, wow, man, you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't look at himself as, he's looking at himself as I'm earning my livelihood and for my family. And I respected him a lot, mm. right? And I thought, hold on, happiness is not through the type of job you have, but um, the value that you put, what you use it for. And that is, you know, your family, yourself and so on. Uh, if you, you know, sickness, embrace sickness, embrace suffering, uh, there was a, a woman who had three uh, sons, but they became entrepreneurs. I, th I forgot which great companies they're part of right now. And they asked her, what did you do for your children to become so successful? If we're thinking from a materialistic world. She said, I taught them to be detached from valuing themselves based on materialism. How did you do it? Well, it's on YouTube. She goes, um, I got them involved in community events. We are involved feeding the homeless, looking after the sick, going to nursing homes, um, looking after people who are in destitutes. I even took them to a mental hospital to them to see, to learn skills and learn meet with the nurses, learn how to, how to look after them. Um, I took them on, on camping trips. I got them a, a part of um, a charity organisation. This is a non-Muslim woman mm. saying, and this is what Rasulullah taught us it's to be. Like. Mm. And if you were to go back in time, 1,400 years, and wanted to look for the Prophet, peace be upon him, guess where you should look first? In the community, Cemetery. all right. Where, which part of the community do you look for? Oh, children, the old people, yeah. Nah. Marketplace, you're getting closer. Marketplace is the last place you would look Get for. Because Mark, we'll cut that out. We'll, no, we'll talk about it. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Be kind of the last person to go to the marketplace, shopping centers, and be mm. the first to get out. Not literally. It mm. just means if you don't have to be there a lot, like just get yeah, out if you don't need to. Don't just go for, for a holiday. For no reason. Winter because shopping, it yeah. develops consumerism in you. That's actually mm. what makes you attached. The more you see, because that's what mm. they set up for, man, to really catch your attention yeah. and get you addicted to it. Walk in, window shop. It's a whole point yeah. of advertising yeah. and all that. Yeah, yeah. No so, so places like the market, shopping centers, consumerism, looking at advertisements on, on social media all the time, seeing what other people have bought and not bought. Um, these things, I think, be exposed to them less and less. Mm. All right? Mm. And uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said, don't go to the market. But if you were to look for the Prophet, peace be upon him, look at this, check this out. Look for the 
group where very poor people are sitting. Ragged clothes, poor people, look for them. And there, most likely, you've got a bigger chance of seeing where the Prophet is. So you go to that group, you see all these poor people, but you still can't, you still can't find him because he's dressed like them. He's dressed yeah, like those poor people. It doesn't make oh, them yeah. feel that he's mm-hmm. better, right? And he's talking and smiling with them and eating the way they're eating. Mm. You've got to ask, which one of you? And that's what the Roman, um, the, the Roman ambassador from Heraclius' time in the, the Byzantine era, when, when the Prophet was Salaam. around, they sent one of their commanders as an ambassador to talk with uh, uh, Umar, radiallahu anhu, you know, and he was the Khalifa. Mm. You saw him sitting, he's just lying down in mud, well, not like muddy, muddy, but like outside, with normal clothes under a tree, with no guards, nothing. He says, this is, this is your leader? Yeah. He wouldn't have picked him out. Right? And that's what the Prophet ﷺ taught him to be like. And uh, he said, Aminta, uh, adalta fa aminta fa nimt. You applied justice. You found security, so you were able to sleep. No guards. You are like the rest of the people. You don't see yourself better. So... Uh, being around people who don't have what you have. These types of people we should attach ourselves with. You've got refugees here in Australia. Let's ask, go to the mosque, ask, where, where are refugees that have just come off the boat here? People have just come round. Go and visit them. Mm. Take a back. Well, like, take, people of SubhanAllah, I know a lot of these brothers and sisters, they are the backbone of our community and you will not hear about them. These are the people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. They're the people who are not after fame and fortune. Yes, some of them, they do go on social media only to encourage other people. Not many people can do that. And they get double the reward for encouraging people and they're sincere about it. These people, you don't hear about them. Mm. They come and they bring bags of rice or a bag of whatever. Or they go down to Woolworths or you know, Safeway or Coles and, or whatever, any other place. And um, better to buy from a Muslim shop as well. They bring them uh, some biscuits and things and just leave it, You know, knock on their door. This is just... Uh, gift or whatever from Muslims in the community mm-hmm. and what that does for you I asked at one time I was in need without going to too much detail and someone had set up uh, something where they go look you know take some food to this person I just rocked up I, I got teary I said man I don't need the food go give it to someone else I said no no I asked them why did you do that and they said it makes us feel happier and yeah, better. Yeah. It's for me. I'm doing this for us. Mm. What is it? When I give, I invest in myself. Wallahi al-Azim. I give. So give. But for yourself to having that intention. Of course. Because a lot of people give like gifts, money, or do services for external. So it's to build that, you're saying detachment, we have to give for ourselves. Yes, when you give... Mm. You are purifying yourself from being attached. Mm -hmm. Look, some people, they discipline themselves. Some people, Allah disciplines them. Mm. How does Allah discipline them? He might take away something from you. He might take away something from you. Isn't that right? Like a little baby or a little child sees you sucking a lollipop. I want it. You give him a little lick, two, three, three, four, five licks, he thinks it's his now. Forgets that it wasn't his. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes takes away stuff from us. Why? To remind us. Oh my God, I can die tomorrow. I can leave this world tomorrow. What's all this going to ever do? And he, I, I read this book about a, a sister who wrote a, an amazing book when I, when I went through my trial. I'll just say it quickly. When I lost my son and brother. Allah mm-hmm. And this lady, she wrote this amazing book. Someone from this other country sent it to me. SubhanAllah, may Allah reward her. Mm-hmm. And it really benefited me. And uh, one of the pages, what was her name, this sister? Anyway, it's a really good book. I wish I could say its name because I want to encourage it. This sister from Egypt whose, whose husband died, um, was murdered. If you just tell us the book, we can put it on the video. I'm trying I'll to. show a picture. Well, like later, remember later. If you oh, remember later, in a week, right. we'll just add a little picture. Well, next time he comes on, inshallah. So what <laughs> next time, what All she right. said in there is that she was talking about the, the stuff, the things which her husband left behind. Mm. It really touched me, this. I thought, she goes, I came back. And I wanted some attachment with my husband. I want to remember him. I want to have some attachment. So you look for things that remind you of them, right? What did you see? A little watch or a wallet or something like that or a thread of hair she found in one of the books that he was reading. She looked at them and she thought, they're just things. All these things that he left behind. 
they couldn't save him. They couldn't go into the grave with him. They didn't do anything. Mm. They're just things that when we attach ourselves to them, put all our love to them, they leave us. And someone else takes them. For some reason, when I was reading that book, it affected me a lot because I had, my son and brother had things. Okay, they're just things. Mm. They mean nothing. Nothing. But in the moment, it feels like everything. Like yeah. Your well, life you revolves around those things. You also think that's the thing that's going to help me in the situation. Then you look at it and it's like... We're talking about people... That's You need these things in your life. Yeah, necessities. But I'm ta we're ta we're not talking about people who, who have them and they enjoy and they're not attached to them. We're talking mm. about people who attach them because what you were yeah. asking me. People are obsessed as though things are making... They're relying on these things to make them Like happen. they can't live without them. Yeah, and unfortunately people subconsciously attach themselves with them. Mm. So when you remember death, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, visit the graves, visit the cemetery. It reminds you of the hereafter. Truly it does. Mm. Umar al-Khattab is to say, kafa bil mawti wa'idha. Enough is death as a reminder. People, I mean, how, how many people do this now as a habit, as a regular thing? Visit it, you know, contact a sick person, even if it's messaging, right? Learn about who is, who is new in this country, who doesn't have a home, who is refugee, who is migrated, um, who is um, in need, uh, who asks about them, right? For example, um, how much charity do you give? Uh, um, you know, getting, into, getting yourself out of the comfort zone, getting yourself into... Places that you don't feel comfortable and, and, and helping other people. Pick up. Like, I mean, the youngsters these days are sitting at home. They see their mum and dad doing a lot of things. They wait until their mum and dad have to beg them to do things. Mm -hmm. And then there's tension and fighting and yelling. Why do you have to wait for that? They are, they are your mum and dad, man. Like now, when I returned back from Lebanon and lost my brother and son, Allah put my parents with me. They were in Lebanon. Now they're with me together. Now I'm looking at them, saying, hold on, I'm going to lose them too, maybe. And I, and I imagine my mum not being around me, my dad not being around. And it hit me hard. I mean, it, it, so cherish this time right now. So I get up, let's go have breakfast together. Let's have lunch together. Mum, I'm going to get you this. I get up and, you know, I start to work out things to offer. Parent doesn't need it. But it makes them Im immensely happy when you do that. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and those who believe and their children follow them in belief, Allah says, We will reunite them together in paradise and we will not diminish anyone's reward. The meaning of this means if your parents end up, say, in the hundredth level of paradise, let's say a hundred, right? Because mm -hmm. paradise is not just seven levels, it's infinite levels. You know that, right? And you ended up, say, in the lower levels, you, your actions are not enough to get up to the higher levels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that your parents, they're happy in paradise, but there's something missing. Who? Their children, their family. And Allah says, I will bring them up to you and they're going to stay with you just to please you as a reward. And even though they don't deserve it, and I won't bring you down. وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ That's the meaning of what I've just said. That's the value of your parents. Mm. How much? And you know, the value of them, it's okay if I just, see, these things, they make you detached. Mm. Because now you're selfless. You're learning selflessness. Mm. Selflessness is the most, is, is the thing that really values you. That's everything. And the day that you can detach yourself and don't see wealth and everything as much, wallahi, is the day when your happiness is going to skyrocket. Because nothing can harm you now. Mm. Nothing can harm you. No judgment can harm you because you are satisfied. It's called uh, to, to, to be satisfied and at ease and at peace with what you have. Mm. These parents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, on the day of judgment, يَوَدُّ الْمُجْرِمُ لَوْ يَفْتَدِي مِنْ عَذَابِ يَوْمِ إِذٍ the, the criminal on that day will wish to uh, sacrifice or uh, what's the word for it? To um, ransom on that day to save himself from the fire. To ransom what? Listen carefully. Bibani with his own children or sons and his brother. Why brother? Brother is the one you can rely on. He will even ransom his brother. وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ Right? 
even his wife or sahibati, his wife, everyone, he will donate everybody and ransom them just to save him on that day. In that verse I realized Allah does not mention his parents. He doesn't say he will try to ransom his parents and his brother and his wife and his children. and uh, or, No. Only parents were left out and everyone else is put in. Why? Because that criminal will not dare to say, Oh Allah, I'll ransom my parents when Allah had uh, commanded him or her to be good to them. Mm. So to use them will make his matter worse. We'll say, and now even you want your parents, you're going to go even deeper. Mm. How can I ransom your parents when I said, oh, worship me and, uh, and be dutiful to your parents and lower your wing of humility and say, oh Lord, have mercy upon them as they raised me when I was a child. I want you to focus on something. You didn't say, oh Allah, have mercy on my parents as they're looking after me now as much as they love me or blah, blah, blah. When you grow up, you become less and less in need of your parents. And some people have more fights with them. Allah says, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. I want you to think back, 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 back when you were a little baby. Like some, some children, they may think, you know, they may go through abusive relationships with their parents. Parents may abuse them and so on. That can happen, right? But if you look back to when you are a baby, very rarely would you find a Muslim parent, because Allah is saying in the Quran, a Muslim parent, let's say, who would abuse their own baby, their own child. It's natural. The mother looks after the baby. When you were nothing, when you had no power. So Allah reminds you that you own that right. You know what I'm saying? So get up in that home. Help them. Do things for them. Wallah, you start feeling selfless and you start finding that you're starting to detach from the world. Anyway, I'll stop there and show Allah about that. Like love for the reminder because yeah. we forget that. Do you want me to tell you about the the the, the three stripe Adidas pants that I had in year <laughs> seven? <laughs> Go for it, no, please. If you yeah. no, this is this is this is Sorry, a thing. <laughs> no, all the heroes. You wearing stripes too? So. Yeah. Are you wearing stripes? <laughs> I'll check and the Adidas. <laughs> all right, I'll Take say it off. if you want to um, have no, no. it in here. That's fine, inshallah. So it's it's got to do with with validation and how from my time in year seven. So how old was I? I was like so 11, 11 years old, twelve. And that was in, oh, that's yonks ago. Oh, a couple of years ago. No, a couple of years ago, yeah. <laughs> I'm only 23. I don't, I, don't, I don't even remember when I was in year seven. You, don't even, you guys weren't even born, nothing, yeah. So I was in year seven, and what happened at that school is that uh, you were valued based on the brands that you wear. Kids. Alhamdulillah, my father had taught me a lot about religion. Alhamdulillah, I'd been attached to the companions and to the prophets. So... Uh, we had sports, and at that school you didn't have a sports uniform. You can wear any sports uniform, any sports clothes. So everybody wore, wears, took that opportunity to wear their brands. In my days, it was Reebok and Adidas. Nike was nothing. Reebok, Adidas was it. If you had Adidas on a Reebok, you become the popular kid at the school. It's before Jordan. Before yeah. Jordan, yeah, that's Jordan right. Was, that's yeah, right. Jordan was eighty-five. That's right. Yeah. So eighty-five. 84, really. Yeah, that's approximately. Yeah. I was in year 7 that's in 1980. That's when he came in the NBA, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so people used to come in with, three, with, with Adidas. And the way they knew you were wearing Adidas, you've got to have three stripes. <laughs> because that's a trademark. It's three yeah. stripes. Some <laughs> kids would come with uh, two stripes, trying to trick everyone. They go, yeah, and even a funny bit. And they started bullying him. He became oh the talk God. of the town. <laughs> Me? Four stripes. My father's <laughs> mother's migrated from Lebanon. They don't care about Adidas. They don't even know what it is. Ad Adidas? <laughs> Get out of here, you and your Adidas. <laughs> and I said, Bobo, we want Adidas. And okay, Bobo, what do you want from all these people? And Adidas is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Very expensive. So you know how our parents are. I don't know about your parents, maybe your grandparents. They they took us to places like Forges that time. You know, Forges, Dimmies oh, and Forges. Bro, I love <laughs> It's like going to the op shop or something. <laughs> and then they say, um, <laughs> in those days, they say, my dad would look at the pants and say, look at this material. Perfect, beautiful, and it's only five dollars. <laughs> Why do you want to get eighty dollar pants and the material that they, they, they rip straight away? Look, it's like parachute. That's how they talk. Mm. It made sense. It's true, mm. hundred percent true. But when you're a kid, you're going in there. It's like a, a, a prison without the lethal side. Mm. You know these kids. Anyway, I come in with normal thing and I go, ah, oh, he's one of them. Yeah, whatever, a nobody. On top of that, I'm I'm, I'm religious, so I like praying and stuff. I don't have girlfriends. More bullying. Oh my god. <laughs> Long story there. 
anyway, uh, you can't afford it. Yeah, you all got these weird ideas, blah, blah, blah. And I just sort of I, I turned away from them and stuff. Anyway, one day I had an operation on my ear. And, uh, you know, we have in our culture, when you have an operation or sickness, people buy you clothes. Mm. It's my uncle. <laughs> Your cousin, my uncle, Uncle Yusuf. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He our cousins. <laughs> yeah. He brought me. Uh, he bought me uh, uh, sports clothes. A whole suit. A whole tatum. Adidas. I Hectic open it up. Uncle. It's Adidas, man. Well, uh, it's, it. I look three at the stripes. There's three stripes. Yes. <laughs> three stripes. I go, man. That's that's amazing. Favorite uncle. Yeah. I went to school a few weeks later, wearing the entire outfit. Wallahi, that was the best day in my entire year in Year Seven. <laughs> oh. Wallahi. I was amazing, like because you know you were nothing, and now mm. wow, you just shoot right up. Some kids were so obsessed with that validation that they started thieving. They started stealing Adidas clothes from shops. See what happens? Mm. Wallahi, they used to steal them, and they became thieves. Why? Just so they can be validated mm. and accepted. That, it's very sad. Mm. They oh. needed those clothing, yeah. Yeah. This kid comes up and he goes, I've got, I've got Adidas at home. I said, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and he's twisting around the bars and then he just keeps... Start. I go, what do you want, man? And he goes, I've got three of those Adidas. Yeah, I can ask my parents to buy me any of them. I can buy them if I like and I can get another pair. Spoil. Hmm. So I remember these, this. I remember one time also we had to study about Greek uh, um, theology, the, the Greeks and all that. We had to draw a god. Mm. Uh, it's haram for me I don't want to draw a god mm. But then I I don't know The shaitan got to me I, I, drew, <laughs> I drew a fire And I said This is the goddess of fire Suddenly I became More writing class again Everybody liked me mm. Subhanallah It's because That's the world Still till today It hasn't changed Except that's just More f- sophisticated on, on technology yeah. Yeah. You gotta be And talk And do What everyone else is doing Seriously? Yeah, it's yeah. odd to people That you don't have A social media account Like for me Like I don't have one If I tell somebody I don't have Instagram. They think either I'm lying, I'm not trying to give them my Instagram. Yeah. Or it's like, bro, you are right. Like you, well, you normal. Yeah, but they I think they think you like you live a weird life. It just I don't know. I just find that Try telling someone you've never had a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> my God, you know? Yeah. Or no, so in, in, in our old school, because we went to a non Muslim school, have you ever like if you never kissed a girl? What? Like it was, <laughs> was whack to them, man, Allah. Yeah, they couldn't even think about know. it, Allah. But um I was thinking about the um the gambling, uh, what's it called? An, an, an analogy that you're using for like um, validation and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, it actually makes a lot of sense because I was, because we're talking to a psychologist um, last time on the podcast. She spoke about something called emotional bank accounts. Yeah, so an emotional bank account is basically your, like the amount of, um, how do I say it? Self esteem. Yeah. So, like, yeah, self-esteem, the higher your yeah. self esteem is, right. built off about upon, upon your own, like, validation like the more coins you have in that bank account so for example um me and him we we don't have the same we won't have equal bank accounts so like i was thinking about the analogy like you go to a like for example social media is the slot machine and every time you put one of your your coins of self-esteem in the machine and then you roll the dice taking a photo chucking it up online and then well you don't know if you're gonna hit the jackpot today hundred thousand likes whatever it is Or if you're you're not going to get anything, so it's like a gamble in the end of the day. Yeah. So you're kind of putting your your own self esteem on the line, yeah. based off of something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I don't know. All was, oh, 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 my head went somewhere. <laughs> we only have a couple more minutes. Is there any other questions you guys wanted to ask or topics you want to talk about? Just because before we wrap it up, I don't want to make you guys miss out on I something. I want to talk a bit about Jenna in the hereafter because. Like, it depends on people, like their motivation, whatever it is, Islamically, you know, to improve in their deen or come back to the deen. Yeah, of course, yeah. Mine is, mine is Jannah, that's one thing. Yeah, and if I go on me YouTube, too. If I go straight to YouTube on Jannah, it's you speaking about <laughs> Yeah, I'm speaking. So Alhamdulillah. This is the best opportunity for me to speak I don't like to talking it. about the frightening stuff. Right now, yeah, Jannah yeah. is good. We're in it's a beautiful. lockdown. There are pre- people going through a lot of problems. The last thing you want to do is, subhanAllah, how beautiful it is about Jannah, yeah? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that it has eight doors, but he said to... About para- about hellfire, it has seven doors. What does it mean? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my doors are endless in paradise. You know, there are much mm. more. It also means that Allah's mercy is stronger than his um, punishment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, okay, this is paradise. This is my product. My product is expensive. It's valuable. And to, do, and to work towards it is easy. 
It's easy, but you can make it hard. Okay? And Allah says, I don't want from you to do something you can't do. And to help you get into it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, um, if you think of a bad thing to do and then you change your mind, I'm going to count that as one good deed. And if you think of a bad thing to do but you don't, you, and, uh, and then you end up doing it, I'll count it as just one sin. But if you think of something good to do and then you changed your mind, I'll still give you one good deed for it. And if you end up doing it, I will give you from 70 to multiple folds to 700. And remember what we said about 70 and 700, mm-hmm. those numbers, it means it's uncountable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you rewards for just smiling in, 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 in your brother's face and bringing some happiness to them. It's a sadaqah. Moving something off the street is a sadaqah. Uh, even if you don't do anything and you go through pain and suffering and um, you're patient in that. Patient means you hold yourself together. You don't do things that are wrong. It doesn't mean that you don't cry and you don't... Like even if you complained a little bit, that's fine. So long as you don't just say something that's wrong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will reward you for every suffering and pain that you go through and you are patient, whether it is bodily tiredness, nasab. Hmm. Bodily tiredness is nasab. Anything you do, anything you work and you get tired, he's rewarding for every second of tiredness that you're going through. Wasab, um, any kind of sickness, any sickness, even it's as simple as a cold. I'm going to reward you if you're patient with it. Um, worries. Um, so another word for it is anxiety, anxiety, which means hum, hum, worrying about the future. You have an exam coming up and you're worried about it. You get rewarded for it. Um, uh, he even said uh, um, gham, gham means depression, right? The whole world is tightened up on you. Just like Prophet Yunus, alayhi salam, when he was in the body, in the fish, and he felt the whole world is claustrophobic. Allah says we saved him from the gham, depression. Um, uh, any any hurt, someone hurts you with a word or anything, I'm going to reward you for it. And he keeps going until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even the tiny prick of a needle that hurts you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do that? Because he wants you to enter paradise. Mm. Okay, Paradise is uh, what no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and things that no heart has ever imagined. You know, the how can we imagine up here, we don't imagine mm. here. So why did Allah say, وَمَا خَطَرَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ قَلْبِ means the inside, your conscience, your feelings, your heart. Because you can imagine things with your brain. You know, we've seen all this imagination. Mm. But how do you imagine with your heart? How do you explain mm. what your feeling of the heart is? There are things you can't explain. Sometimes your love is so great for someone, you can't explain it. They make poetry and they still can't get there. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? So no heart has ever imagined. Which means there are things in paradise that you cannot explain unless you're there. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that in paradise, uh, when you enter it, uh, as soon as you enter, as soon as you enter, you only that first footstep. No matter what you went through in this life, the worst person has gone through this life will forget every single thing as if it never happened. They won't forget it as in from memory. They will forget the pain. They will forget the struggles. Everything. Mm. The closest example I can give to that, which is a very far example, but I'm saying something realistic in our life, and maybe mothers will understand this. We won't. When they gave birth to us, our mothers, the pain that they went through, I can't explain. I won't even dare to talk about it. (laughs) But what they describe is immense. As soon as the baby is born, they tell you, I don't remember the pain. It's forgotten. Next minute, they want another baby. (laughs) Why? Because some kind of love, something that Allah gives you after that pain, makes you forget the suffering. Mm. Not forget, forget here. Forget here. Mm. Allah. So imagine Allah gives you this Jannah and He says, even a bow's length that's in it is better than the whole world and everything that's in it. The least person that gets in paradise are people who are saved from hellfire. They go into hellfire and they get charcoal burnt. Rasulullah said, until they die. Who are they? The ones who had an atom's worth of tawheed, of iman in their heart. And Allah saves them. He takes them out. He says, I save them with my mercy. Places them in paradise. And they're placed in a river of life. And they grow until they look like pearls. And then they see this paradise in front of them. And Allah says to them, choose whatever you want from what you see. And they can choose from as far as they could see with their eyes. And they say, really, we can take all that? And Allah says, yes, and you will have double that amount too. And... So much for them that the people of paradise, they're so happy that they came. So you think that we go in paradise, everybody's alone? It is the biggest sociable event in, that you could ever imagine. right? And there's no time. Yeah, These people are so happy for you. Like The best thing about paradise is how much you love each other. 
Allah says, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِيلِ Everything that is negative, that you feel in here is gone. And these people, they come up and they go, SubhanAllah, Allah saved them and put them in paradise. وَلَمْ يَفْعَلُوا خَيْرًا قط. And they never did one good deed. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari. They never did one good deed. I'll even tell you a bit more about that, just the sociable part which I've never spoken about. You know when you cross the bridge of the Sirat mm. over Hellfire? I know time's up. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I'll just say this thing. You cross the bridge of Hellfire. Yes. And the believers, the ones who really did, did well, mm. as sabiqun, meaning the ones who were ahead, they prayed their five daily prayers, they helped, they did, they repented, all of that. Allah doesn't harm them. They go shoo, straight over the Sirat. When they go over the Sirat and they're safe, they look back. Who do they see? Muslims. Muslims they used to know in this life. Your friends. Your mates. Your friends. Your mates. Mm. And they refuse. They don't go forward. They will not go to paradise. These Muslims are not going to go forward. They just stay there because they want to save their mates. They want to save their friends. And Rasulullah says that that day they sit on net. You, know, you can imagine them. They are pleading to Allah. Oh Allah. They prayed with us. We used to see them giving charity. Uh, uh, and they try to remember something you've done with goodness. And they say, I witnessed, Ya Allah, we had a charitable event. They were there. Mm. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, uh, I saw them walking to the masjid. They prayed with us that Jummah. I remember, I remember, Ya Rasul, they played tarawih with us. I remember, I remember I visited this, this person to help them and they came along. They'd use anything. And then Allah says to the Prophet, وسلم, what do you think? Shafa'a. Prophet وسلم, prostrates and he says, Ya Rabbi, give me Shafa'a. Let me intercede. And Allah says, You have it. And then he starts saying, Oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. So Allah then looks at these Muslims and says, Go. Go and take out every person you know from the former life who did one thing with you that was good or at least, take them out. So they have angels with them. They go and take the angels and then the angels, they carry them like baggage. Angels are huge, right? They carry 10, 100 of them like that on their shoulders under their arms and they throw them across. That's what the angels do. Some of them have reached their ankles. They burnt in lava of hellfire, some up to their knees, some up to here. And their faces are still okay. Because that's the face they used to pray. Allah doesn't burn the face for these believers. They take him out. They keep taking him out until Allah says, Go back now and, and, and take out anyone who had a, a coin's worth of iman in their heart. They take him out. Go back and take someone who's got a half of a coin's worth in there. Why is Allah doing that? Because He wants us to love each other. He puts that power with us. And that's also part of His mercy. Otherwise, He could have taken them out. When everybody's taken whoever they know and even whoever they can realize, there remains the ones who have fallen deep into the fire. And they're charcoal. And Allah subhanahu wa lets them die. فَيَمُوتُ Why do they die? So they don't feel any pain. Because they've paid for all the sins they've done. So then Allah says, بَقِيَتْ شَفَاعَتِ The only thing left is my intercession. Rasulullah says, He takes out of the fire. حَثَيَاتْ Hathayat means like, a, we call when we shovel something. And He says, we, no one knows how many people Allah subhanahu wa takes out of hellfire. And He says, I have forgiven them. Subhanallah. They enter paradise and these are the ones who are called the poor people of paradise or Allah's saviors, the ones who were saved, uh, sorry, uh, the ones who were saved by Allah, they never did one good deed, meaning the Muslims never saw them do a good deed in this life. So my advice is have friends. Have friends who are believers and strong and they call you to the masjid because they're going to mean so much on the day of judgment. What's the best thing to see in paradise? Allah's face. Oh Allah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Allah's, Allah's face. Allah's we can't we don't yeah, that's what Allah says, but we don't know what it looks like. We mm -hmm. don't you know, it's just a word. Mm -hmm. But on the day in, in Jannah, you <laughs> you look up and this beautiful light comes down. Amazing light, more than the sun, and you think it's Allah. Okay, is is this Rabbi? Mm -hmm. It's in the hadith, it says, Is this my Lord? Mm -hmm. Comes down, ends up being a wife. <laughs> Can you imagine that? How beautiful she is? Huh? Um and uh, if you don't have a wife here, Allah makes a wife for you. You know, what about women here? Yeah, they also have husbands there, right? Did I say husbands? Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe. Uh, Ibn Qayyim <laughs> says you have whatever you will. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of respect for the, for the women, he doesn't say stuff like that. But in paradise you have your spouses and you think the light is amazing until you forget. You forget your palaces, you forget your horses, mm -hmm. you forget your uh, the, 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 the trees and the rivers and all that beautiful spot. And you forget about the angels that have been coming in. Angels come to you and they speak to you and, and they love and they say, Salaamu alaykum bima sabartum ba, peace be you that you were patient in the former life. And you forget. Then they bring to you a feast. They, they're chefs and you have people who serve you. They're your own servants. They look beautiful. They come to you and they smile and they say, anything you want, we'll give you. We love to serve you. We've been created to serve and we love to serve. It brings us happiness. It brings us... And uh, you keep doing all that stuff and then uh, someone calls out, says, go, go to that meeting place. 
the market. Market means meeting place. Everybody goes from all around the world. Muhammad, the prophets, the prophets go. All the believers go. Everyone, the angels come around. Like it's bigger than the entire universe. You know this place, and you go there. Everybody's together. And then you see the prophets and you see all the other believers and then their light starts coming onto you and then you become prettier, you become more handsome, you become more beautiful because their light's like when you shake hands with someone who's got perfume and their perfume comes on you, right? Mm. Over their beauty comes to you. And your wife looks at and goes, you look more beautiful. And you go, and she, you say to her, you look more beautiful too. And then she says, yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> they stay the same with that, you yeah. know, that cute thing. Anyway, <laughs> what happens after that is uh, you're waiting there and then suddenly you hear someone, they say, and he, he says, uh, are you pleased? He said, who's that? He says, yes, we are pleased. And then someone says, it's Rabbuna. It's our Lord. It's our Lord. And he says, how can we not be pleased, our Lord, when you've saved us from the fire and put us into Jannah? He says, oh, one more gift is left for you. I haven't given it to you yet, and I fulfill my promises. He said, what else, Ya Rab? What else? Because you can't imagine that your mind is taken away by this beauty. That yeah. You forget that you need to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah more, subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah. says, فَيَكْشِفُ الْحِجَابِ This is in Sahih Muslim. Rasulullah said, Allah reveals the veil and you see Allah. Wallahi, you see Allah. You think Allah is going to hide himself from us? No. But here in this world, you can't see him because Allah created us in a way that we cannot see him yet. Right? You can't see him. Eyes cannot reach him. In the hereafter, Allah makes it so that you can see him. And that is a reward for the people who enter paradise. He says that you look at Allah and you forget all the beauty that took your breath away first and now the sight of Allah takes your breath away from all the beauty that you had seen before. Subhanallah. And then he says, how about I finish it with this, Allah says, My pleasure is upon you forever and eternity. I will, you will never see from me being displeased with you. You don't have to obey, you don't have to worship, you don't have to do anything. Just enjoy Forever. One person said, man, don't, won't they get boring? Enjoying forever and ever? You know what I said to that kid? I go, how about you give me your spot? I'm happy to be bored. <laughs> <laughs> when we get there, we'll talk about it, man. Inshallah. Except me. I'll have 70 years. Don't disturb. I'll make us of those people. Amin, amin, amin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did us all. Amin. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We want to say thank you, Sheikh. Jazakallah khairan for having... Allowed. Sanitizers. Shout sanitizers. Shout out for coming on the podcast. It was an amazing episode. The podcast is available on all streaming apps and on YouTube. So enjoy, share it around, subscribe. See you guys later. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum.